Hey there, Gary Parrish. Welcome back to the CBS Sports Eye on College Basketball Podcast, where we sometimes discuss camel fighting dodo birds, leaky black. Matt Norlander is here with me. He's at home in Connecticut. I'm in New York City doing studio work for CBS Sports Network. If you're watching on YouTube, please smash the like button like you're Brandon Davies. You have consent. If you haven't yet subscribed to the YouTube channel, knock that out while you're here. It helps us when you do that. So please go ahead and, and do that for us. Let's get into it. The biggest game on Tuesday night. It was Kansas, Kansas State inside Allen Fieldhouse. Game started, and it really wasn't competitive. Final score, Kansas 90, Kansas State 78. Jayhawks led by as many as 13 points early, by 16 points in the second half. Cruise to a 12-point win. As a result, Texas is now sitting alone atop the Big 12 standings with nine regular season games remaining. Longhorns are 7-2 and two in the league. Kansas, Kansas State, Iowa State, TCU. Each one game back at six and three. Dead lag. What'd you make? What you saw Tuesday night inside the fog where Kansas took control early and and never really relinquished it. It didn't relinquish it, but I thought there was a. For Kansas State, I actually thought there was a Viper pit type of element awaiting and all things considered, you know, and I saw what you said on CBS Sports Network during one of the segments on Tuesday night. If you're K-State, you absolutely take a split. I think what Stover mentioned, uh, there hasn't been a season sweep by K-State of KU since 92-93, I think he might have said. And so you take the 1-1 split, like <laughs> unquestionably 100%. Um, it, it, no, it wasn't. I don't want to say it wasn't competitive because it was competitive. It just wasn't close. I, I actually right. thought there were moments in the first half where Kansas, that building on fire, Bill is set at the top of the podcast. You could barely hear what is his play-by-play partner was saying, and they, they had the cans on, but it was just that loud. They were ready to go at the fog, as you would expect, wanting revenge after that overtime loss all of two weeks ago there. So it's a, it's a good win for Kansas. It brings more intrigue to the Big 12 race overall. I mean, KU, as a result, by the way, Palm, uh, Jerry Palm swapped the teams on the one line, but there's so much more room to go. So we'll see on that. K-State was a one going into Tuesday, and now K-State's a two. Kansas, because it got the win here, Kansas is now a one in the eyes of Palm. Welcome to February, by the way. We are February 1, one month to go until March. But yes, the season, it breezes along with a quickness there. It's the Big 12 results overall, though, the standings. Right now, as you mentioned, Texas atop, 7-2. and two, And then you've got a four-way tie for second place. And then Baylor, which is capable of finishing atop the league, has four losses. We'll get to them in a little bit as well. Um, but that's what, that was really, GP, that was my biggest takeaway. Like, from the game itself, Dewan Harris played well. When Juwan Harris plays well, Kansas almost always wins. Like, and that was a really, uh, a really positive development there. Jalen Wilson continues to be a, an outright stud, and in fact, I had the brief mention of this in my Sunday column from West Lafayette on Edie. I'm just of the belief that Edie has has clinched the Player of the Year again. Knock on wood, barring any kind of injury, which uh, you know, which I'm not factoring into that that statement, that that assessment there. But in a normal season, if you did not have this seven, four Goliath doing things we almost never see Jalen Wilson would have an extremely compelling case for national player of the year. And there are a couple of guys that are, you know, giving good chase to Edie overall. I would put Wilson really neck and neck with Timmy right now. I'd have Trace Jackson Davis in there and then probably Brandon Miller. I think, although, you know, Hawkes, Sasser, even to at Arizona's playing well, but Wilson is probably the best among them right now, and he was awesome yet again. So if you're Kansas, yeah, you had the three-game losing streak, but you're Kansas. You get back on the steady. You get a win at Rupp. You come back three days later. You take care of business against K-State before turning around later this weekend, and you'll go up and play Iowa State on the road. Not not to quibble. I, I would stop short of saying Zach Eadie's locked up the National Player of the Year. That, that feels a little bit like, I, and I agree with you, he's the far and away leader. There's no question about that. But that feels a little like – Every once in a while in college football season, somebody will be like, and they've secured the Heisman with three weeks to go. And then, and then, you know, somebody has a ridiculous game on a big stage and it just sort of flips it. So I'm not ruling out that somebody else could win national player of the year, but I see in the YouTube comments, somebody's making the case right now. Jalen Wilson should be the player of the year over Zach Eady with all due respect. Cause Jalen Wilson is awesome. Has been awesome. Uh, that competition in this moment on February 1st is not close. Like if you were doing 60 votes, 100 votes, however many people you wanted to have vote on this thing, uh, Zach Eady should be number one on every ballot. He should be a unanimous national player of the year right now. He's a statistical monster on what has been the best team in college basketball. Back to Kansas. It's wild. 
This time, literally this time last week, Kansas was on a three-game losing streak. And people were questioning, like, are they really a uh, contender to, to, to repeat as national champion? Uh, were they just playing over their heads the entire time? Fast forward to today, they added a quadrant one win at Rupp over the weekend, quadrant one win last night. They're now nine and four in quadrant one, four and oh in quadrant two, 13 and uh, four in the first two quadrants, zero losses outside of quadrant one. They've got two more quadrant one wins than anybody else in the country, Purdue That's included. It. That is such a, by the way, that is such a Kansas thing. Like yes. this has happened multiple times in recent seasons. We look up and they might have the best record in the country or whatever, but you just look up right around this time and then you check the quad one wins and it's Kansas is clear. Like it's, it's <laughs> alone in the first place. So I'm not surprised by this overall. Bill Self, we, we mentioned it every year, but it is worth repeating uh, because of the function of the Big 12 and how good it is, but also his non conference scheduling approach. Uh, he is always, Bill Self is always putting his team in a position to have that exact. Uh, situation most quad one wins and because of that it rightfully so as we sit today it's it's a one seat yeah um some of that is just the byproduct of this is pretty simple you're the best team in the best league year after year after year so you're probably going to lead the country in quadrant one wins because you get so many opportunities um i updated the top 25 and one this morning i did jump kansas into the top five i stopped short of the top four but you could make an easy argument that Kansas would be a one seed right now. Um, obviously, whoever wins the Big 12 is – I shouldn't say obviously, but I would assume whoever wins the Big 12 is going to be a one seed. You could end up getting two one seeds from the Big 12. But right now, the top 25 and one would be one Purdue, Alabama at number two, Houston at number three, Tennessee at number four, Kansas at number five. Some other interesting developments in the Big 12 from the past two nights that will – lead us into a broader conversation about this league. Texas did beat Baylor on Monday night. Texas Tech beat Iowa State on Monday night, and that is why the standings look the way they look. With Texas alone in first, 7-2 and two in the league, followed by Kansas, Kansas State, Iowa State, TCU. They're all 6-3. and three. Baylor is 5-4. and four. Everybody in that group has nine league games left, nine regular season games left. What's interesting is, just sort of in between halftime hits and everything else last night, started looking at this. If you, I, I personally think this is going to come down to Texas, Kansas, Kansas state. And I won't be surprised if we have co-champions, all three finish 12 and six or 11 and seven or, you know, 13 and five. We'll see. But there is no denying from this point forward, obviously in the big 12, it's a round Robin schedule. Everybody plays the same schedule, but from this point forward, Kansas State's got the easiest schedule. Kansas State's nine games left, five at home, four on the road. Kansas, four at home, five on the road. Texas, four at home, five on the road. So Texas and Kansas still have one more road game than Kansas State has. And look at – here's Can, here's Texas's road games. At Kansas State, at Kansas, at Baylor, at TCU, at Texas Tech. Yuck. Kansas is at Iowa State, at Oklahoma, at Oklahoma State, at TCU – at Texas. Check out Kansas State's at West Virginia, at Texas Tech, at Oklahoma, at Oklahoma State. Needless to say, winning anywhere in this league is difficult. Ask Iowa State. But Kansas State's four remaining road games are against the four worst teams in the Big 12. The league is sort of separated. Six great teams, four good but not great. And Kansas State's only four road games left are against the four that are in the not great category it doesn't mean i think kansas state's going to run away with this thing again i'm predicting co-champions but from this point forward if you want to make a case for kansas state besides jerome tang and Ke um, keontae johnson and marquise noel uh, make the case around the fact that kansas state going forward has the easiest schedule of the what appears to be the legitimate contenders yeah uh make a note of it for sure right now as we speak just in terms of quadrant performance kansas state is it has no bad losses which is great it is it is eight and four overall and among teams in the net right now that rank you know 12th or better kansas state is 12th in the net um that is that is a pretty strong performance with five and three in quad one i i don't know some of my notions on this uh, on the teams in this league gp were twisted just a little bit over the past two days because Texas Tech finally got off the schneid, had the biggest comeback in program history, comes from 23 down in the second half against Iowa State. One of those results where I did not think Iowa State was capable of blowing a 23-point lead. It can have some offensive issues at times, but defensively it's been so good, so reliable, and it has some guys who can step up and hit 
some big shots. And Gabe Kalsher is a great all-around player. Caleb Grill has stepped up huge in multiple moments this season. Good for Texas Tech. You finally got a win. It's been a mess down there all season long. And that had to feel really good for Mark Adams and that program there. But it's it's kind of a worrying sign for Iowa State. Like, I was of the belief that of the six in the league, the team I actually had the least amount of confidence in in terms of making a Final Four run. And not all these teams will make a Final Four. Maybe none of them will. But I would I would put... I would put money on at least one Big 12 team will find a way to get to the Final Four. There's just there's six really, really good teams. But the team that I think that was le- least likely to do it, I personally thought it was Kansas State for just a few different factors there. You know, pick 10th in the league, overcome a lot of expectations. It's a really, really good team. But in the hierarchy of the league, I actually thought it was least likely. I don't think you agree with me on that point. But after seeing Iowa State do what it did on Monday, and I know it was on the road, but it was just a little bit, a little bit alarming. Now, again, it's going to get more good wins, and we're going to have more little plot twists over the next four weeks in this conference. The Big 12 is just going to provide us – it provides us watchable games practically every single night, and Iowa State will continue to get more wins. But at the moment, it has dropped four of its past six. The two wins have come at home, but they've been to Texas and Kansas State, so they haven't even been against the bottom four in the league. But – I don't know. I just wait and see on, on ISU. That was just, uh, I, I kind of was not kind of, I was, I was shocked that it gave away a 23 point lead, even though it was on the road because Texas tech. Yeah. It rates like top 70 and Ken Palm. It's just not really that good of a team. And it's definitely the worst team in the big 12. And I didn't think it would have put itself in that kind of position. The funny thing about Texas tech, Iowa state, besides blowing the big lead is that on Monday morning, Iowa state was tied for first in the big 12 and Texas Tech was alone in last. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's a pretty big gap when you're looking at standings. Tied for first, alone in last. And yet when Texas Tech won the game, it barely registered as an upset. Iowa State was only a one-point favorite in that game. I thought Tech was favored. The The closing line I saw, okay. you might be okay. right. You might be right. But the closing line I saw was Iowa State minus one. But, probably- but here's the point. He, like, it barely is an upset when the last place team beats a team that is tied for first in the big 12. Um, according to Ken Palm right now, even first place, Texas will only be a four point favorite at last place, Texas tech later this month. And that more than anything else is what makes the big 12, the sports toughest league. Even the best team in the conference will only be a slight favorite on the road against the worst team in the conference. That's pretty wild. <laughs> like, think that about that in good. any other yeah. league. Take UCLA or Arizona and put them at the worst team in the Pac-12. They're yeah. going to be expected to win that game pretty comfortably. You can do that yeah. with basically any league, but in the Big 12, it's why I've been saying I didn't have the data to back this up or I didn't take the time to look into it to back this up. But one of the things I've been saying for a while is, Unless you think it's Texas Tech, and it might not even be Texas Tech, and it doesn't appear that it is. Um, even the best teams in this league, which double as some of the best teams in the country, cannot go on the road in conference, play poorly, and win. In every other league, the best teams in those leagues can go on the road, play poorly, and still win a game. In the Big 12, I don't care if you're Texas, Kansas, Kansas State, Baylor, Iowa State, TCU, if you go on the road in this league and you don't play well, you have a good chance of getting beat. Yeah, and good and a good win for TCU on Tuesday night. Just holding off West Virginia. Remember, no Mike Miles, no right. Mike Miles available. You get that. That's that's one of those where it would be understandable, even though TCU rates better than West Virginia, it would be understandable. West Virginia coming off the buzz of beating Auburn, getting a road win at Tech prior to that, if they've been able to steal it. And I thought actually it was kind of a sneaky good moment for West Virginia to increase its tournament credentials there. Can you get one on the road without TCU having its best player? Wasn't the case there. So the Horn Frogs, in doing so, you know, kept general pace in the Big 12. It's it's right there with Kansas and ISU and K-State with a 6-3 and three record. And yeah, Texas at 7-2 and two with its home win over Baylor on Monday night. You know, overall, like big picture on, on the Longhorns, and I don't know if uh, – you know, I, I didn't hear the Sunday show with Cobb, but I would figure you would have talked about this a little bit. So I'll be I'll be short on this. But Texas to have rebounded after the, the final margin of that Tennessee game was not reflective of how the game was. That was a 30 point game. It, it wound up 82 71. But I watched a good portion of that from the media room and on my computer at Assembly Hall and to come back 
have the game on your home floor and beat Baylor uh, in impressive fashion. You know, I, I, Roddy Terry continues to do a really, really good job. And there's there's some buzz today. I, I noticed a couple national writers were at the were at the Tennessee game. So Forty and Dane O'Neill both have uh, Texas stuff out uh, today or in the past 24 hours. So he, understandably so, right? Rodney Terry's getting his due, and he he deserves it. I almost feel like maybe it was just ever, ever, ever so slightly being under-recognized what he's been able to do. He's got that team, which is a top 10 team for now in pole position in the best conference in the country for now at K-State at Kansas home to West Virginia at Texas Tech is next. So three of the next four are on the road. The script will flip again here, but credit to Terry and that team for, for doing what they've done. I can't get enough of the big 12, man. And it's just last thing for me on this. It is a 10 team league, which has benefited the conference for the majority of the past decade, since it went to 10 teams, this is its ranking in Ken Palm overall conference hierarchy three in 2013. And then we go one, 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 two, two, one, one this year. So a top two league every single season since 13, 14 and the best conference in the country with the exception of 2020, in 2021 next season you'll have the influx of all these teams cincy houston byu ucf it will still be a very good league it'll be a 14 team league temporarily until oklahoma and texas which are expected to be there one year before they scoot off to the sec there's no guarantee in fact the likelihood is that the big 12 will actually dip because the more teams you have in your league you'll just have you'll have a little bit of a soggy bottom and it'll bring you down totally understandable but i would anticipate probably the conference will still register top two in the country maybe even the best but one thing that has enhanced its ability to get six bids seven bids with reliability that has happened every single tournament either six or seven teams into the tournament from the big 12 is because there are 10 teams. You have the round Robin. We love the round Robin, big 12 and big East GP, as you well know, they're the only leagues that get to do this. And that really fosters it. In addition to the necessary accomplishments you have to do out of conference, November and December. And then the, the seven and three record against the SEC, obviously this past weekend was big there, but don't, don't overlook the fact that this being a 10 team league actually has helped it. Uh, in in addition to the likes of Kansas Baylor winning national titles, it's been a special uh, concoction here for the past decade. For the and you might think that this league being clearly the best league in the country with all these great teams, it's like, how many bids are they going to get? It might only be six. I say only like six is a big number, but it might only be six and all six could be top four seats. <laughs> Which would, I think Paul wrote about this a month, uh, three weeks ago. I think, and I don't have it all out in front of me. I haven't looked at it. That might actually present a problem for the committee and its bracketing principles because you almost never have six teams qualifying through the one through four lines and avoiding rematches and, and geography and preference and all that kind of stuff. So just keep that in mind. We'll, we'll see if somebody slips to the five line and, and gives the committee an out there. But you are, you are right. I, in fact, I think, I think all six right now register as, as four seeds are better kind of across the board, Palm and other bracket forecasts. All six are in the top 16 of my top 25 and one uh, that, that, uh, so, so take that for what it's worth. We're going to discuss some, some other results from the past two nights next, but first a word from our partners. Italy's best clubs and brightest stars bring show stopping skills and unbelievable thrills in the fight to the finish for the Scudetto. Stream every Serie Match Live on Paramount+. Plus. So, Kansas, Kansas State, Texas, Baylor, those were the biggest games of the past two nights, but they weren't the only games. Some other results worth noting. Clemson lost at Boston College 62-54. Tigers are still in first place in the ACC, which speaks to um, how down the ACC is this season. Indiana lost at Maryland. The Hoosiers are... Uh, no longer on a winning streak and had reached five games. That's over. Alabama beat Vanderbilt by a billion. Nevada beat San Diego State. Fans stormed the court. Fordham topped St. Louis and is now 18-4. and four. And you might be wondering, why are we talking about Fordham? Trivia time! Why not talk about Fordham? Let's go Rams. Here Trivia we go. Trivia time! Give it to me. When was the last time Fordham won 18 games in a season? I mean, in an entire season. I got to think that's 91, 92. 2007 would be the correct answer. Okay. This is in today's court report. 2007 is the answer. It hasn't won. At, one more win is 19. It hasn't done that. Yes. yes. If you have 18 wins and you win one more, is 19. It has. I, I misheard the question. Okay. 
Fordham has not won 19 games in a season since 91-92. Trivia time. Oh, God. A reverse trivia time. You weren't ready for it. Name the Mm. league Fordham was in in 91-92. It's a league that still exists. It's not a defunct league. Give you three guesses. (sighs) SEC. Everyone in the chat, don't help him out. Was it the SEC? (laughs) Stop. I feel like Fordham. 91-92, where were they? I feel like I remember a Fordham, Florida football rivalry. Danny Warfel mm. got upset by Fordham. That didn't happen. This is known as filling time. Fordham's never been in the SEC. Is that what you're telling me? I do know. I, here's the thing. I looked at this last night because I was scrolling through looking for – I'm about yeah. to hit you with another trivia time. I was scrolling through. <laughs> I was scrolling time through. on a trivia time on yeah. a trivia time. Yeah. I was scrolling through looking at it, and I, I saw Atlantic 10, and I was like, were they in the Atlantic 10 way back then when they – and they were – uh, when they won the uh, 18 games under Derek Wittenberg. And then there's another league, and then they were an independent for a while before that. But I don't know. Unless it's the SEC, I don't know what league Fordham was in before it was the All 18. Right. That's an X. Fordham, five-year run. It's first year in the Patriot League, I think first year. Uh, the first year or last year. Uh, the Patriot League members, when that happened, 19 wins. The program itself, I don't have this up in front of me, but I looked at it. I think it has only won 20 or more games seven times in its entire history, and it's going to do it this year. I have a quick thought on Fordham, but you had another trivia time, so I'll step aside. Go ahead. The Rams have not won 18 games since 2007. They got to 18 wins before February 1st. That's awesome. School record for wins, 26. Went 26-3 and in 1971 as an independent Trivia time. This is Who, absurd. You're dropping 71 Fordham trivia on me. Yeah, go ahead. What do you we are about? we have reached the point where we're doing 1971 Fordham Jay trivia. Wright, if he's listening right now, is like I, I got to turn off this podcast. I cannot handle this right now. Who coached 1971 Fordham to a 26 and three record? Knowable name, gettable name. You'll know that. I don't know that you can get it, but you'll know the name. Oh man. Okay. Let me first of all. Let me. Sometimes the chat they either. No way to look it up. So it's, I'm now not looking at the chat. Fordham and seven. Did the uh, did the coach also coach in the NBA? Oh God. Okay. I don't know. I, I'm just asking. I, 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 don't, I don't. I don't think so. But the coach went on to coach at a prominent college, but at a prominent American university. Hmm. See, I feel like. The coach I feel like also I've, I've seen... went in. It went into broadcasting. Okay. Um, Fordham in 70, 71, 72? 70, 71. 70, 71, Of course. How far did they go in the tournament? Oh, who? who I'm, I, I'm just asking for. Con- what is this? You need to have it all at the ready. Who could? Who? Who could? Who? I don't even know. Who knows? I feel like there was one year Fordham actually. I could be misremembering this. I feel this, like there was one. This year man coached this. This man coached Fordham only this one season. Wow! And, he's, and one season, twenty six and three school record for wins. It's a little bit like Chris Beard's one season at Little Rock. Went there for one year, set all these records. Okay, That's what this man did. Okay, and then made the jump to the big university after this. That's correct, and and took that university to a Final Four. What decade? 70s. Um, man, I'd really like to get this. Uh, His uh, family owned a funeral home. You can tell I'm on the Wikipedia page now. <laughs> yeah, yes, I can. Is the man still with us? He is. He's still with us? I mean, not with me personally, but he's, but he's, he's still with us. I'd love to hear it. He's alive somewhere. And went into broadcast. <laughs> unless I missed it, and unless Wikipedia missed it too. Oh, God. Which is always a possibility. It could be. You never know. Man. Um, I'm not looking at the chat. How about this? Has, it, has it been revealed in the chat at this point? He had a nickname, and his nickname was connected to his family's funeral home. We should just do Fordham trivia every Wednesday. We, should, we really shouldn't. I'm trying to think about every team that made the Final Four in the 70s right now. Um, 
What conference did he coach in? When he was took the school to the Final Four, what conference was it? I don't even know that it was in a conference. Oh, my gosh. I think they were an independent. That should give it to you. A big it, school that was an independent. Okay, I – that's not the Marquette was an independent when McGuire took him there. He was not at Fordham, though. Um, McGuire's family did, never ran a funeral. Home. I know. Uh, independence that made the final four in the 70s. You're gonna hate uh, yourself when I say this to you. I am. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna be absolutely furious with myself. Um, independence that went to the final four in the 70s with the, like, have I heard of this funeral home? Like, <laughs> no, well, have you heard of any, have you, is, have you heard of any funeral home? What I mean, funeral home have you heard of? That's what I'm saying. So I don't know why you're bringing that. Like, why is it? Because uh, I it was I was looking at the Wikipedia. Me, I don't want to keep. I don't want to keep the people waiting. Just to, whatever. What? Who is it? Digger Phelps. Oh my gosh! I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> Get it, Digger. Digger. His family owned a funeral home, so they nicknamed this dude Digger. What? Knew it. Gosh, I knew it. I knew it. I knew that. How are you going to get nicknamed after your family business like that? Digger. Like my, my wife owns a. He's with us, by the way. Digger's still with us. My wife owns a, a, a children's store. What if my kids get nicknamed? <laughs> Something Just... after a children's store. <laughs> Digger. I've got kicking around here somewhere. My pre-CBS days, I was running College Hoops Journal, and I went up to ESPN to just – I sat with them on the first two days of the tournament. I was with Vital, uh, Billis, um, Digger, all them. And uh, and Digger had all these specially made highlighters and Sharpies with his with his signature on it. So he's like, here you go, young man. He gave me like oh, three I, of them. I, I don't know. I, I got them somewhere around here. Hold but, up. Uh, you, had, you have Digger felt souvenirs, and you just discarded <laughs> yeah. them? I didn't discard them. I've got them somewhere. I, this was 09? So yeah, it's been a while. It's been a minute, Parrish. But yeah, <laughs> I was just thinking you had like the did highlighter. You, did you highlighter. know he was named Digger because his family owned a funeral home? That's not true. That's what Wikipedia says. I had I had never heard that before in my life. But it like makes he sense. was he was digging graves at like fourteen. That's <laughs> yes. the deal. Yes, Stop. Isn't it that is not the case. I don't know. I don't know if that's what he was doing, but like maybe you know, maybe. One minute. I can text. You want me to text Bill to see if that's the case? <laughs> I'm going to text him right now. I am. I am. Did Digger I felt dig, did he ever actually dig a grave? I bet he did. Somebody gets sick and it's like, you know, they call out and and then uh, Big Digger. That's that's what we're going to call. Okay. That's what we're, that's what we're going to call his dad. Big Digger. Okay. First, I'd be real careful with this. <laughs> Yes. In fact, if people want to hit that back 15 second button, you might need to listen to that one more time. Yeah, we're we, we're we're one slip up away from going viral here. So I'm gonna I'm gonna stop. <sighs> but I could see Digger's father. I too. Oh, that is that is that is annoying as hell. Man, I could, I, I could see Digger's father one day. Somebody calls out, and he'd be like, "Hey, Digger, can you get me? A, I need six feet of dirt pulled out the ground. We got to bury old Lucy from down the street." I can see that. That's not unimaginable to me. Oh, gosh. All right. Let's forward them real quick. <laughs> forward them real quick. Because I actually had a couple thoughts on a lot of those teams. Um, they might be court report material here pretty quick. Now, I understand the like the resume isn't tournament worthy at this point. It's just not. Uh, they're 139th at Ken Palm, but they're 18 to 4. Who gives a damn? Keith Ergo has done a wonderful job. Wonderful job. 18 and four, that program, that's a school that I've long believed just doesn't fit in the A-10. It, it, it needs to be in a smaller conference. It previously was in a smaller conference. Um, it has never performed well in the Atlantic 10, but it's doing well this year at six and three. It joined the league, you know, back in the 90s. Um, it might have actually made the leap from the Patriot to the A-10. If not, it was from the Mac to the A-10. And it just, it's never made the tournament out of this conference there. It is regularly in the cellar, and this year, Ergo springboarding of what Neptune was able to Neptune got this program from two and 12 in Neubauer's final year to 16, 16 a year ago, which was, which was wonder work. And now they're 18 and four. They beat St. Louis on Tuesday night, all credit to Ergo and that staff for just bringing optimism to the program. You're going to have to win the a 10 automatic bid in the tournament, but I will say this, 
you know, the six and three projected to go 11 and seven. We'll see if they can get the double buy in Barclays, the way that the a 10 bracket that is like it's Fordham in, in right next to Brooklyn. Like you actually will have a pretty decent fan contingent. I would think if you can get the double buy, a lot of anticipation leading up to that Friday quarterfinal, I'd like to see it. So I'm glad you brought him up because the Rams are, uh, they're a cool story and record wise, they are among the best in college hoops. You got anything else on Fordham or, or want to talk about the other results? I, that's all I know about Fordham. <laughs> everything, everything I know about Fordham, I've said. Okay. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. I, I love that Rose Hill gym is, is a, is a sweet, sweet place. Um, I'd actually go, I'd actually dip down. I'm not that far from Fordham. I would actually dip down and go to the UMass game next week, but I plan on going to see Marquette at UConn. I want to see Shaka and MU in person for the first time this season. Otherwise I'd dip down, uh, I'd dip down to Rose Hill, one of my favorite joints in all of, uh, in all the college hoops there. Um, Bama beating Vandy. Ooh. I think we had something happen this week. I I'm guessing, I don't know this. I think it's never happened in the history of the sport. Oral Roberts, talk about another team with a gaudy record, although Oral Roberts is probably getting back to the tournament with Max A. Smith. Keep an eye on it. Uh, they're dominant. They beat South Dakota by 50 on Monday. And then last night, Bama just eviscerates Vanderbilt. And I don't know if we've ever had back-to-back nights in the sport ever because it doesn't happen a ton where a league opponent beats another by 50. We've had it 22 times in the past 10 years overall. Trivia time. Okay. What school has won by 50 or more against a league opponent more than any other in the past 10 years? Gonzaga. Correct. Three times. And so we don't get it a ton. We get it basically once or I twice. I want that to count as an immediate trivia time correct answer. It does. It does. I trivia okay. timed you, and you got it. Okay? okay. Um, the point is we only get it once or twice a season where you've got a 50-point-plus gap between league foes. We got on back-to-back nights. That almost never happens. A really good sign for Bama, which, yes, it, it got knocked off by Oklahoma. Great win for OU. But then just the absolute no-nonsense, go back home and just not even allowing Vanderbilt to have even a wisp of hope. I actually find that to be a, a good sign. Clemson losing at BC. Well, let, let me. Uh, uh, I didn't know if you'd have anything on Bama, but okay. yeah. Oh, I got plenty of stuff okay. on Bama. I mean, they beat Vanderbilt, so I thought it was a drive-by, but by all means. Yeah, but you don't you don't know what I've been going through with Alabama. Okay. Cause the Crimson Tide, you might have heard they got blasted by Oklahoma over the weekend. And I kept them at number two in the top twenty five and one. I just kept them there. With the rationale being they still have the the best res the second best resume in the country behind only Purdue. Why would I drop them below people with inferior resumes? I mean, it was yeah, it was one disgusting performance, but it's still just one data point and a larger season and i kept alabama at number two much to the frustration of of fan bases all over the country most notably the tennessee fan base and so to see alabama do what it did last night that was good for me that was good for my heart went 19 of 41 from three jerry stackhouse after the game said wrong team at the wrong time <laughs> <laughs> just basically said we played the wrong team at the wrong time. So now Alabama's 19 and three overall. Crimson Tide six and three in quadrant one, five and oh in quadrant two, 11 and three in the first two quadrants with zero losses outside of quadrant one. As I explained on Sunday show, you should get to it if you get some free time. Literally every team in the country, besides mm-hmm. number one Purdue, either has fewer quadrant one wins than Alabama or more losses inside quadrant one than Alabama or more losses outside of quadrant one than Alabama. Most teams have all three. Now, some Tennessee fans, these, not all, I would never paint an entire fan base with a broad brush. That's not fair. It's not fair to any fan base. But some of these Tennessee fans who are too dumb to understand numbers, but, but somehow smart enough to activate Twitter accounts, can't seem to grasp that in this moment, even after Alabama lost to Oklahoma over the weekend, Alabama still has a better body of work than Tennessee. Like, I love Rick Barnes. I actually I actually like seeing Tennessee do well. I was born in the state. But some of these UT fans, boy, they couldn't be sillier. Alabama has six quadrant one wins. Tennessee's got four. All of Alabama's losses are quad one losses. Tennessee got two losses outside of quadrant one. In other words, Alabama's better in a win column, better in a loss column. So Alabama's body of work is superior to Tennessee's body of work. Both are great bodies of work, 
but Alabama's is superior on February 1st, 2023. All right. Continue. Clemson, body of work, need some work. Oof. Now, oh, it's, it, it's, it, it's still top 20. Um, I think it's top. Let me look at this real quick. I thought it was top 20. What do we got here? It is top. What am I looking at here? It's top 20 in quad one and quad two wins. So it's done well there, but it's got a quad three loss, lost at BC, and it's got the two quad two losses. And the metrics don't like Clemson at the moment. Strength of record is the best one, 41st among the six team sheet metrics there. It's, you know, it's tied to top the league. Just, it just, you got to dodge those, man. Because when you've lost to a bad South Carolina team on the road, but a bad South Carolina team, and you've got dropped by a bad Loyola Chicago team, it's, it, that stuff can really, really bring you down. So Clemson still has time, um, but I would have advised against that loss. So that's that's a that's a mark against the, the Tigers. I would, I would always advise losing to Boston College if you're trying to win an ACC title. I was just thinking about this last night because I don't have Clemson ranked. I didn't have Clemson ranked even yeah. before it lost at Boston College. You know, they got two, like you said, quad four losses, now a quad three loss. Um, they're 62nd in the net, 67th at Ken Palm, and yet still – Technically alone in first place in the ACC standings. Um, and okay, well, the loss didn't have them tied with Virginia. I have that wrong. I, I think I think they have. I, they, I think they played one more game than Virginia. Ah, okay, tied in the loss column though. Then that might be. Yeah, right. that's right. But like from a percentage points perspective, got it. Um, uh, Clemson is is technically alone yeah. in first in the ACC, ten and two as opposed to nine and two in the league. Has a team in the ACC? on February 1st, ever been alone in the conference standings and ranked outside of the top 65 at Ken Palm? I can't yeah, imagine that's ever been that true. can't have ever happened. Outside of the top 65 has to be a first. I mean, has and that, that just speaks to how lousy, broadly speaking, the ACC is this season, that a team as fundamentally yeah. flawed as Clemson on February 1st can be alone atop the league standings. It doesn't mean there's no good teams in the ACC. I think Virginia's good. I think Miami's good. I think Carolina it's is going to be there. Match, it's just the, bo the bottom's a mess, and somehow, and Clemson's just mostly beaten up on those mess of teams. Remember we talked about Big 12, six teams, right? Might only be six. Right yeah. now, either in or right there on the fence, ACC, Virginia, Carolina, Duke, NC State, Miami, all in. Yeah. And then and then Clemson and Pitt are right there. And then the bottom half is what brings the AC. That's that's what bringing the ACC down. So the ACC could actually it's not inconceivable. The ACC finds a way to match the Big 12 and bids. The Big 12 is just going to have all teams that are one, two, three, fours or fives. The ACC could have two two teams going to Dayton. So uh, keep that in mind. But you're right. That, that is, certainly is an, an abnormality uh, there. Virginia was able to get a win at Syracuse by five on Monday night and then Jim Beheim dressed down a student reporter for like the 50th time in his career. That yeah. Was like, and that was just, you know, like I'm not, I don't get caught up on any of this stuff too much, but come on, man. That was a totally reasonable question. Totally reasonable. If you're unfamiliar, Benny Williams is one of Syracuse's best players. He was not in the building. And so locally there was a lot of buzz and curiosity. Well, where is he? And so after Syracuse loses, the first question Beheim gets is uh, what is his status? And Beheim was immediately on the defensive, and there we go. Syracuse is thirteen. I, I wasn't. Sure, I didn't know who asked the question. You say it was a student reporter. I saw. I saw the person take credit for asking the question, or just. It, it, I saw someone retweet that into my feed, and I clicked on the bio, well, and it is. It was yes. It okay. Is. Well, um, it, it, you know, if that student reporter happens to be listening, like my tip of the hat to you. Um, first off, it was a fair, totally fair and appropriate question, and secondly, it takes. Um, for lack of a better word, some balls to to open up a press conference asking a Hall of Fame coach that question when you are a student reporter. Um, that that's yeah. a that's a, a, a impressive trait to have at such a young age. And um, I thought that the the student reporter handled it perfectly. And Jim Beheim, not so much. Not so much uh, agreed. Elsewhere, uh, with what you mentioned, Indiana losing at Maryland. IU was obviously hoping to go on the road, pull off a win, set up a big. Big home tilt, which it'll still be big, but have some momentum produced coming to town this weekend. Instead, Maryland wins um, 
I don't have too much on IU, to be honest. I saw them in person. They dominated Ohio State. Ohio State has a litany of issues there. I expected to win. I wanted a close game. It wasn't close. They won by 16. They won running away. Trace Jackson Davis didn't even need to have a good game to win on Saturday. Good on the Hoosiers. They're on the right track. Love being back in that building. And then I'm not surprised by the loss at Maryland. Uh, a little bit surprised by how it wound up playing out there. And good on good on Maryland. You know, Jameer Young is... He has he was good early and he has continued to be a, a significant factor, the Charlotte transfer for the Terrapins. Dante Scott is the guy, though. I mean, he he does so much for that program. And I don't know. Maryland feels just like a constantly moving target, like because Young has been as reliable as they could have possibly asked him to be. He's averaging in the neighborhood of about 20 points per over his past seven, eight games. That's been key in, in addition to Scott. But they are just. They go, they go on the road. They don't win. The only road win is against Louisville. That doesn't count this season. I'm sorry. Home, they've won every time. I could, be, I could beat Louisville on the road. One on five, he's got it handled, yes, folks. by myself. No, no doubt about it. Maryland has not lost at home with the exception of the greatest coach in UCLA history, obviously. That's the only time they've been defeated in College Park there. So from a resume perspective, and we're really nudging into, you know, bubble talk territory and, and, and just – tracking all this stuff maryland could be developing into one of the more intriguing resumes uh you'll recall like a few years back rutgers had this jekyll and hyde thing where they weren't winning on the road uh but continued to win at home we'll see if maryland winds up doing that it's got to play at minnesota this weekend minnesota's not good so it really gets put to the test here as a clemson at bc level kind of matchup there would strongly advise you not lose at minnesota this weekend but a good win Kevin Willard, big picture, has done a good job first year in College Park. But we just have to, to see a bit more. They they do have a – there's a vibe to this team where they they feel – I feel like Maryland and Illinois are the two biggest wild cards with Illinois having the, having the higher ceiling. Uh, right. But those are the two teams in a Big Ten that has just – just it's, it's a morass, man. Like there's just so much – unpredictability night over night over night. Purdue is three games up. I actually tweeted that Purdue was like, I, I'm, I, I've given the player of the year award to Edie and I've given the big 10 regular season conference title to Purdue and Purdue fans who are accustomed to having some good teams fall flat are, <laughs> are not exactly thrilled about uh, my, uh, my forecast there. You don't need to worry Purdue fans. You, you, you are three games up. You are so clearly, clearly the best team in the conference. You are going to win the big 10. Okay. Just ease up. You're going to lose another game. You might even lose two more. You're three games up. Illinois, Rutgers, and Northwestern are in second place. Those teams are not going undefeated down the stretch. The Big Ten is absolutely yours. Good win by Maryland on Tuesday. What you got? I almost moved Illinois back into the top 25 and one this morning, and then I was like, I just can't do it to them. Like, I just can't. I mean, I wanted to. You could make a case for it, but I just feel like they would immediately go out and lose their next game by 17. I didn't want that on there, you know? I didn't want that on my shoulders. You were you were looking out for them, which is which is kind. Um, by the way, but Bill is to get, Bill is to get back to me. I don't I don't want to forget this near the end of the pod. He goes, um, Digger's father was an undertaker, and yeah. Digger has some great corpse stories. Oh wow, he's an American treasure. Imagine being a fellow. We got some great corpse stories. I wouldn't mind having a good corpse story. You know, you know, it's a really really good show. You ever watch Six Feet Under? Great show. Great, my, great I think show. my wife watched it. I don't think I, I don't think I ever got around to it. Little, if you watch it now, like it feels a little outdated because it came out early two thousands. Great show, top three all time series finale. Really good stuff. But if we're talking corpses, six feet under. It's it's somehow I think I watched the finale. I, I I think I watched the finale because like I didn't watch anything else. But okay. people were like the finale was great. I think I just watched the finale. I that was me in The Sopranos. Never watched another episode of The Sopranos. I watched the finale. That was it. Oh, no. Sopranos were great. We watched the whole yeah. thing. Um, anyway, Maryland. I wouldn't, mind, I wouldn't mind having a good corpse story. Okay. I have so many stories about people who are I alive. Think I, would. I would have. I would mind. I, I don't need a corpse story in my life. If, if I, I can so avoid many, that, I'm going to try and say like All my stories are about people who are alive. I don't have any good corpse stories. Not one. I need to mix it up a little bit, you know? <laughs> Dude. Add something to my, add something to my game. Okay. I feel, I feel like I haven't added anything to my game in years. Got all these same stories about alive people. Meanwhile, Digger Phelps over there got tons of corp stories. He does. Uh, that's a damn shame. Um, mm. Before Nevada, we look ahead, but, 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 but go ahead on the yeah. Just, just. I wanted to give that was the only other one that that okay. you brought up, but I at least wanted to address there because you worked late. You look fresh, by the way. 
Oh, I'm not. I went to bed at four and got up at yeah. seven thirty. You look fresh. Four you look went fresh, to bed right? at four and got up at seven thirty. And I didn't want to get up at seven thirty. It's just at some my I just reach a point because like seven thirty Eastern is like six thirty central. When I'm at home, I get up at six forty central every morning to get my kids off to school. So it's like something just wakes me up. It's sleep apnea in part, but um, I just and then I try to go back to sleep, couldn't go back to sleep. So now I'm just sitting here tired. Shout to Sean. In the Tired chat. and got no court stories. My he, life's really not going Wednesday, that well. I run the court report and he said the corpse report from Matt. N. <laughs> <laughs> there will be no corpse report. CBSports.com. <laughs> Although this week's lead item is on Sule Boom from Xavier. We'll get to the Musketeers in just a second. I do want to give a shout to Nevada, which got a very big win. The Mountain West continues to help itself. The conference, I, I said a couple weeks ago, it's going to send at least three. I'm now highly confident. I won't go pretty winning the Big Ten confident, but highly confident that this conference is going to send four teams. Right now, Boise State is 18-5. and five. San Diego State, which lost 75-66 late Tuesday night at Nevada, uh, is sitting there at 17-5 and five and 8-2 and two in the league. Those are two are top of the conference. Nevada getting a really good win, um, as Rothstein correctly noted during halftime of that, Nevada's home opportunity here against SDSU was its last good one at home. Its remaining games are against Air Force, Fresno State, San Jose State, and UNLV. There is not a tournament-level team from the Mountain West that's going to go back in that building for the rest of the regular season there. It will have more opportunities, obviously, quad one, quad two level on the road. But I actually thought a really critical win. You might even make the argument that in the first two weeks of the first two days of this week, GP, Nevada got the most important win to its tournament resume. It's clearly and comfortably in right now. Palm has Boise State, San Diego State, Nevada, and then New Mexico. Oh, remember the Lobos, last undefeated team in the country. They're now 19-3. and three with three losses. Utah State is the fifth team in the tournament picture. It's out right now per projections, but it's 17 and five overall, six and three in the conference. And it's got a big one tonight hosting New Mexico. And that's another instance where if, if Utah State can get that win, that's an FS1 game at 1030, then all the more so the Mountain West is is really has set itself, it's up, la, 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 set itself up well. We talked about them on a recent pod but I thought that was a, a really well-played performance by Nevada, which lost its best player, Grant Sherfield, to Oklahoma and has gotten even better. So I almost, like, I looked at moving Nevada into the top 25 and one this morning as well. Like, they were, on, you know, Illinois, Nevada, a uh, few other schools um, in contention. I ultimately moved Miami back in and Missouri back in, pulled Indiana out, pulled San Diego State out. Mountain West, uh, five schools in the top 40 of the net. Pac-12, two. Mm-hmm. Now, the Pac-12 has got two awesome teams, Arizona, UCLA. I don't think there's an awesome team in the Mountain West. And this could be a situation where, and I hope it doesn't happen because I don't want to have to listen to this, but like they could get four teams in again, and then they could all four lose their opening games again. I know. Um, I uh, would either against that, but they're not going to be. They're not going to be high. Like, you know, they're not going to be three seeds or anything like that. They there's actually no- might. Yeah. Sorry to cut you off. They might. Yeah. They might have a repeat GP. Remember yeah. Colorado State was the highest seeded team as a six. Yeah, it's not unthinkable that the, actually the best team like gets on the six line. That's and all. we're at, we're at the point where if you took these five schools: Boise State, San Diego State, New Mexico, Nevada, Utah State, I would pick any of them at home against any of the others. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. yeah, so so, it, and it hasn't completely played out that way, but it has in parts played out that way. So it's a really fun league, like. Um, I know we spend so much time on the Big 12, Big 10, but the Mountain West is a is a fun basketball league this season. Before we look ahead to the next couple of nights, real quick, you broke some injury news on Tuesday. Xavier Zach Fremantle going to miss at least four weeks with a left foot injury, Sean Miller told you before he told anybody else. Musketeers are currently tied for first in the Big East standings, Marquette, Providence, but now likely going to have to play their final nine regular season games without their second leading scorer, who doubles as their leading rebounder. Not ideal. What else do we need to know about Zach Fremantle's foot injury? Well, I think Fremantle and his – I see Sule Boom leads today's court report. We'll link that in the pod description at some point here. So if you're a Xavier fan, you're looking for good news. You know, I, I talked with Sule and Sean after last week's win over UConn there and saved it for this week. And it's kind of just, you know, why he's been – a top three transfer value in the country. So there's good stuff there. And his role is actually going to probably have to increase even more as a lead combo guard. But just the, the story about why Sule Boom got to Xavier and how he's become unexpectedly like guy from UTEP as a top three transfer in the country. You don't see that coming. Kind of a cool deal there. And uh, among the most valuable players in the, in the Big East and, and 
de facto, I guess, in the country when you consider Xavier's overall standing. But the the bummer to this is the Fremantle injury. Fremantle, you know, he was averaging 15 points a game, eight boards, three assists as a power forward, as a big, and he was shooting 58.5% from the field. Beyond that, now he doesn't, he hasn't shot enough threes to to qualify among the most accurate three-point shooters in the country, because if he if he did, he probably wouldn't maintain this rate. But Xavier, because it's a top 10 offense in scoring and offensive efficiency, uh, it has so many guys that shoot it well. Fremantle's hit 63.6% of his threes. Now, he's only taken 22, but he's made 14 of them. So he does so much to spread out that offense. He, you know, as a big, he's kind of emblematic. And he's been a good player for a number of years. But Sean Miller changed his philosophy. And now I'm not having him. Miller did tell me. This part really wasn't in the story because I didn't want to bog down the quick news or too much. They're going to go small. Like he will play small. It will be I, pretty much explicitly three guard lineups here. You will have uh, with with Fremantle out. You will have Desmond Claude, a good freshman, play more minutes. But you're going to have Jerome Hunter, who has been good as of late. He has really come on. Started his career at Indiana, played last season at Xavier, and now earning you know earning real minutes. It's about to jump. Like he's going to Miller told me he's going to ask Hunter to play probably 25 minutes a game. We'll see if the likes of, you know, like Kiki Tandy, if they go small, is he going to be on the floor a bit more? He's a senior, at least like you're going to have veteran guys there, but the way that Xavier is going to have to win for at least four weeks, it's going to be interesting. They play Providence here tonight, Wednesday. It's a, it's a home game. Those teams are ranked 16th and 17th in the country. They're tied atop the biggie standings. Um, keep itself steady, but no free mantle is significant. Miller told me he's out at least four weeks, mm-hmm. but there is a chance that he can come back in the final week of the regular season. If he did that, it would be March. March one is the earliest that's at Providence. And that could be for the one seed in the Big East tournament. We don't know. could be for the two, could be for the three. And then they're home against Butler. We'll see. I almost wonder if we'll see where Xavier's position is in the league. When we get there, Miller, the good news, if you're a Xavier fan, and this was quoted in the story is, um, he will be back for the Big East tournament as long as there are no setbacks with his recovery. They are absolutely expecting Fremantle to be back in time for that. He's just going to be in a boot for at least two weeks. And then two weeks from now, they'll get him walking on a treadmill. He'll be able to get up, you know, light work, just some shots on the floor, nothing too crazy. It is a left foot injury. He did have surgery on this foot in the fall of 21, but Miller said he doesn't need surgery right now. It is a, it is a notable injury. The good news is it's not season ending, or at least it's not expected to be that when he had the surgery, it wasn't a stress fracture. It was a stress reaction the last time. So they are labeling it a foot injury. Um, it's not a break, best I can tell here, which is which is key. But he's a really good player, a really important player. And he is good enough where asking Xavier to win the Big East tournament without him is too much of an ask. So it's good that he's expected to be back. And then asking Xavier to like make an elite eight without him is, is, is asking too much and he should be back for that. So uh, always hate to hear injury news uh, for Xavier. It just is particularly intriguing because of where they stand. And um, it comes right before they set to play a huge one at home against Providence on Wednesday. Yeah. I'm with you. Like they can get through these next four weeks without him and still comfortably make the NCAA tournament, all that stuff, maybe even you know, continue to compete for a big East regular season title. But if you're trying to go wherever you were trying to go in that bracket, you, you need, you, you know, you need your second leading scorer, leading rebounder to be a part of it. So hopefully he heals uh, perfectly and quickly and is back on the court. ASAP looking ahead to the next two nights. We run you through some games on Wednesday night, Penn state at Purdue, like you mentioned, Providence at Xavier, Tennessee at Florida, Villanova at Marquette, Pitt at North Carolina, Oklahoma State at Oklahoma, Florida State at NC State, LSU at Missouri, New Mexico, another good Mountain West game at Utah State. On CBS Sports Network, we got a Big East doubleheader, Creighton at Georgetown, followed by Seton Hall at St. John's. No 11 p.m. Eastern game tonight. Woohoo! Time to On Thursday. On Thursday night, Florida Atlantic at UAB, my owls. That's on CBS Sports Network. Wisconsin at Ohio State, Michigan at Northwestern, Oregon at Arizona, Oregon State at Arizona State, Houston at Wichita State, Washington at UCLA, Santa Clara at Gonzaga, San Francisco at St. Mary's, Washington State at USC. Give me some thoughts on some of that stuff. (laughs) I don't know if he's, I don't know if Parrish has ever given you that many games. Well, because here's what happened. Last time I left some off and you scolded me. So I said, you know what? I'm going to put every one of these. Every one of these. I didn't hear George, George Washington at LaSalle. I didn't hear UMass at George Mason. I didn't hear Army at Lehigh. Step your game up. Um, 
All right. The most intriguing one is Providence at Xavier. Let's see what X looks like without Fremantle. And then Providence. It's got, I mentioned to me, Sule Boom is a top three transfer of value in the country. Keontae Johnson's one on the list. And then maybe it's Boom and Hopkins, like two, three. What? I, what? K- Kendrick Davis? Four. I'd have him four. What? I'd have him four. He's about Hopkins to win AAC Boom player on, of the year I, over I, I, Marcus Sanders. Well, no, no, no. Kendrick Davis, I'd have fourth. But actually, I was looking. That's there disrespectful. Are, there have been a lot of really productive and valuable transfers this year. It, that you say that one been, more. You say that one more time. You say that one more time, yeah. and I'm gonna have me a corp story. Okay. You'll be my corp story. Okay. <laughs> I would have Kendrick Davis narrowly fourth. On the oh, value transfer. This, who knew this is how I'm going to get my corp story? Yeah, that's the irony right there. Yes, indeed. Would have never uh, predicted this 15 minutes ago. Nope. No one had that one. Uh, New Mexico, Utah State, again, that's that's a wonderful Mountain West affair. Utah State at home, big spot there. Uh, that is must-watch stuff for me. Oklahoma State, Oklahoma. This is one of those deals where if Oklahoma State can win on the road, it's going to continue to – really make that split in the from the six to the seven line of the big 12 all the more pronounced there because those teams uh i don't know oklahoma state i would say oklahoma state would have the better resume if it beats oklahoma right now oklahoma has a better resume but that's bedlam we'll have to wait and see on that pittsburgh it's done well in a hot seat season for jeff capel um i bet you didn't know this i bet you didn't know this i know everything okay what's pittsburgh's record against north carolina in his past five games well, they beat them last season because that was that big deal. And then they already did. They, they already beat them once this season, right? So two and three. Okay. Well, that adds up to that's uh, four and one. So, okay. Four and four one. And, well, Pitt's four and one against North Carolina in the past five. And it's one his past two games in Chapel Hill. <laughs> How about that? So Pitt at UNC on Wednesday night, seven o'clock ACC network. Uh, Pittsburgh is 15 and seven. Eight and three overall. I expect UNC to win, but it's done. It's done well. So that's. I was a little surprised to see that Penn State at Purdue. I, I expect Purdue to to roll there. Although Jalen Pickett's been tremendous for the Nittany Lions, and that's worth keeping an eye on. There, kind of an important road swing here for Penn State. They got Nebraska after that. They got to walk in the pinnacle. So that's uh, mm-hmm. that's one to keep an eye on. But yeah, no, it's 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 been a really really good week overall. Wednesday's loaded up with with stuff. I would say Providence, Xavier, New Mexico, Utah State are probably my two most must-watch there. Tennessee plays at Florida. Tennessee has won in Ken Palm. Florida has not lost to a team outside the top 50 at Ken Palm, but it has not beaten a team inside the top 50. So it's, it's got so much work to do, but a home win over the Volunteers would actually juice up that resume in a major way. We'll see if they can do it. I don't know. Uh, your Thursday stuff, Florida Atlantic, longest win streak in the country. Uh, continues to do well. I listeners, off season listeners to the pod, and if you are an in season listener listening right now, I'm just telling you, it get, it can get crazy in a fun way in the off season. So stick around well after we finish the final four. But you will recall last May, I did a story about how there was this idea to have a bunch of mid major teams in addition to the A10, all these conferences that aren't the big six basically come together for the next season, not this season, but the season after and have this February one week only after the Super Bowl non-conference thing where every mid-major team would have one home game and one road game and they would be, they would be matched up. A computer would, would schedule this two, three weeks out in advance. You'd play similar teams. Um, I had Kevin Paga, who's the guy behind the KPI. Uh, if we had hypothetically done it this season, those matchups would have been determined this past weekend and they would be scheduled for after the Super Bowl. So this week's court report has the matchups that those would involve. And I'm just going to give you a couple here. Florida Atlantic. We would have Florida Atlantic against Charleston. Like, tell me you wouldn't want to watch that game. FAU against Charleston as an improv mid-major matchup. Like, that'd be a wonderful thing. You'd have San Diego State at Memphis. You'd have UNLV at Loyola Marymount. You'd have St. Mary's at Boise State. You know, you'd have Florida Atlantic. They got to go to San Diego State on the return. So FAU would host Charleston, but then they'd have to go on the road and play SDSU. There's a lot of these kind of games. And in doing so, it would increase the chances that you would have these teams, particularly if you go 2-0, and at having that large resume there. If you want to, understandably, mid-major coaches will bitch about how so few are getting at large bids. And I get all that because the system is rigged against you from a scheduling perspective. If you want a way out, this helps you. It, even if it helps you get one more or two more bids overall, 
it would do it unquestionably. Paul did the math. There would be 85 combined quad one and quad two matchups with this with this system. And there'd be 132 games involving 66 teams from 19 conferences that are ranked 135 in the net or better. That amount of volume undeniably affects the shape of the bubble, the teams on it, near it, or off it. It's not scheduled to happen because there are coaches got too afraid of this, but the idea is not totally dead. It could still happen two years from now. So if that idea intrigues you, it's in detail in this week's court report, Florida Atlantic would be involved. They play at UAB Thursday night, seven o'clock as GP mentioned on CBS sports network. That's a really, really good game there. Uh, Thursday's a, a little bit softer. Northwestern lost on Tuesday against Iowa. You'll recall it had the COVID pause. So it's got a quick turnaround. Now it's hosting Michigan. And that is, I mean, Northwestern's a better team than Michigan right now, and Michigan doesn't have a tournament resume. Um, A loss there, it doesn't end at GP because they could win like seven of eight, and then they're back in it. But uh, Michigan's just a a weird disaster this season. So I I weirdly find the Michigan-Northwestern game to be as intriguing in my college hoops sicko mind as anyone else on Thursday. All right, we ready to get out of here? I'm going to walk around the city, see if I can find me a corpse story. You know, I probably could. Maybe could. Um, I think you walk out of your hotel. I'm giving you six, seven blocks max before you get to a corpse story. If you're really feeling adventurous. I am feeling adventurous. Okay. Shouts to Devin Downey. Shouts to Chester, South Carolina. Shouts to Hook. Shouts to Larnell. Shouts to Digger. Shouts to Digger. <laughs> Shouts to Digger Phelps. Thank you guys once again. Listen to the Island College Basketball Podcast. If you're not subscribed, please go subscribe anywhere. You subscribe to podcasts, including Apple Podcasts, Spotify, over at Apple. Nice review. Five stars. Type some words. There's more of us than there are of them. That needs to be reflected in the comments. If you haven't subscribed to the YouTube channel yet, knock that out. We're going to talk to you again on Friday morning. Are those the Digger Phelps highlighters? They aren't. I thought they might be, but they're not. <laughs> I was just, Jack, I was just giving, the, you're watching on YouTube, I was giving the ode to Digger with the, with the highlighter there, but there. <laughs> Bye.